What's up, everybody? This is the Homie Hangout, where we help others move in excellence. And today I'm excited. I have a very good friend. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and then he's going to tell you uh, more about his journey. So Mr. Danny Murillo is from Norwalk. He grew up in a neighborhood known as the One Ways, and he's a graduate student at California State University, Long Beach, in the School of Education. Danny got his GED in 2007 at the age of 27, and then went to enroll in community college. He graduated from Cerritos College in spring 2012 with an associate's degree in Spanish and graduated from UC Berkeley in 2015 with a bachelor's degree in ethnic studies. In 2013, while at UC Berkeley, he co-founded the Underground Scholars Initiative. Shout out USI. <laughs> Most recently, Daniel was the program analyst at the Campaign for College Opportunity. He is the primary author of their latest report, The Possibility Report, From Prison to College Degrees in California. Currently, he is the Smart Justice Fellow at Michelson 20M Foundation and the Research Lab Coordinator for the Project Rebound Scholars Program. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Now mm. let's get down to the fun step. So first of all, thank you, bro, for, for sharing your time with us. I really appreciate it. No, uh, for what, sure. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. So what is your role as the Smart Justice Fellow and Research Lab Coordinator? So uh, those are two different roles, right? So the Smart Justice Fellow at the Michael Sen 20 M Foundation. In that role, I, I will collaborate with Gail Yan, the California Policy Director at Root and Rebound. We are convening the Smart Justice Think Tank, mm -hmm. right? What we're doing is bringing together higher education advocates, practitioners, and directly impacted leaders to establish a list of guiding principles that will serve as a common agenda for the field governing California's higher education in prison and on-campus support programs for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated students, right? So pretty much kind of created these guiding principles that will tell higher education programs on the inside and programs on campus. These are the things that you need to do to be able to support formerly incarcerated students. And these are like the non-negotiables, right? You need to, you know, make sure that X, Y, and Z is in place and shape. Okay. And then the research lab coordinator for the Project Rebound Consortium is a cooperative effort between three Project Rebound campuses. In Long Beach, where I'm a student at, and research lab coordinator, Cal Poly Pomona in Pomona, and Cal State San Marcos in, in San Marcos. Let me tell you what Project Rebound is, then I'll tell you what the lab coordinator is. Project Rebound is a support program for formerly incarcerated students at the Cal State system, right? There's 14 campuses that have a fully functioning Project Rebound program. Those 14 campuses together make up the Project Rebound Consortium. And so as a research lab coordinator, I'm supporting 10 formerly incarcerated students who you know, are now Project Rebound scholars who will be conducting original research on Eurasian topics related to incarceration and higher education. What I'm doing is I'm facilitating these workshops throughout the year, popping them along with the research, doing classes. Overall, just talking about like what research is along mm -hmm. with what they can do with it besides publish the research but also being able to go to grad school and continue their education or being able to work in the field as researchers. A, a quick question. When you say scholar and when you say research, to a lot of folks, those sound like big ivory tower terms, right? So when you say a project rebound scholar, or obviously we're going to get into underground scholars and you talk about research, can you simplify in a way what, what that is, kind of demystify maybe what those words mean? Well, for sure, for sure. Because I know when I first got into community college and, and started thinking about UC Berkeley, I realized that it's all about doing research. And I used to think for me, research was looking at things through a microscope or, or like dissecting animals or doing things with microchips. I never knew that doing research in the academic sense included doing interviews with people, mm -hmm. right? Like creating a list of questions, five, 10 questions that you're going to ask a group of people and compare all of the responses and see where the themes match up. Doing surveys, one of my first research projects regarding the segregation of Mexican-American children in Westminster, California in the 1950s. I did a research project on that, looking, looking at the California state law, looking at different articles related to that and kind of came up with my own theory and, and the questions. And I looked at the research and came up with some results. That's here. helpful. I mean, we know people doing research on the media portrayal of gang members. And so you just look around. Hey, when quote unquote gang crime is reported in the media, how is it reported, right? right? Versus let me do a little bit of digging on some of these stories and see, well, when similar crimes are committed by people that are not called gang members, how is it reported? Okay, right. there's my research. I see this group, I see that group. And now I have an idea of why this might be different. And that could be your next research project. 
And, and you can also use, use your research to change policies and create new policies that are going to benefit people that are being impacted, right? And whatever it is that you're researching. You can also do what's called community action research. Say you're going to investigate why kids are being suspended in a specific school. They're always being suspended. The research can be creating some kind of action-based research with, with the students that are being impacted after doing the research and the results make, make some recommendations about creating some type of program that'll benefit the students instead of uh, punishing them. You know, and that's a good point. And, and, and you know, I want to kind of get into the underground scholars, but it, engaging the people, because you can go to the school and be like, hey, what you guys are doing is not right. We know what this is. This is racism. This is classism. But that approach a lot of times is not going to actually produce change. But if you do some quote unquote research, hey, we've looked at the numbers. We see a pattern. I can show you what you're doing wrong. And I have a way for you to make it right. Then it's, you have more action at that because then you can tell other people, hey, do you see this? See yeah. how they're doing this? What if things work this way? And you can rally the community to be on board with that. And then when you go, you're not just a pissed off parent or an uncle in the community. Mm -hmm. That's important to have that. But there's not a lot of power in that within systems. And so what is Underground Scholars? And how did that come about? So under, Underground Scholars was co-founded at, at UC Berkeley, right? And so currently what Underground Scholars is a support program dedicated to supporting formerly incarcerated and system impacted students, right? Mm -hmm. at, at UC Berkeley and now has expanded its presence to eight other UC campuses. So UCLA, UC Merced, Santa Cruz, Davis, San Diego, Irvine, Santa Barbara, you know, Riverside. At UC Berkeley, it started as a student organization. I'm, I was one of the co-founders, right? Me, along with a group of people who were formerly incarcerated or system impacted. Right? We use that word system impacted, so kind of unpack it, right? What that means. A student who is not directly formally incarcerated, but has a parent, brother, sisters, cousin, sibling, friends, and, and even we don't really include uh, the, those that are either self-identified or, or are labeled uh, gang members. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of homies that never been busted. Right. A lot of homies that never been busted, but they've been through some shit. But that's kind of a system impacted, right? Someone that ain't been busted, but kind of just has a very kind of direct connection to those systems of incarceration. Yeah, I kind of adopted the term system traumatized. If a parent turns in their kid and then their kid goes to jail, Technically, yes, your system impact, you have a child that's incarcerated, but you did that. You know what I mean? Versus, like you said, somebody who maybe doesn't have a direct relative that's been incarcerated, but they're from the neighborhood and all their homies have died or, or gone to jail. That person has been traumatized by the system. They just haven't been locked away in it. And, and so, or people that are like, oh, my, my brother in another state, oh, he's in prison, but you ain't talked to him in in 20 years, you know what I mean? It's very loaded because sometimes you're like, nobody in my family talks to my brother, but you know, I'm going to claim him as part of this. Right. right. When I got to UC Berkeley, there was no uh, program or, or anything really set up for formerly incarcerated students. So someone that I met the first day at UC Berkeley, Stephen Sifra, who as soon as I met him, I discovered that he had been in Pelican Bay Shoe. And so that's also been my experience. I, I did some time in the shoe in the Bay. And so like in my head, like I start thinking like, oh shit, like, who else is here and shit? Not in a bad way. Not right. in a bad way. Like, let me go start checking 128 and shit, you right. know? But like, but like more like, oh shit, like I, I didn't think I was gonna come to UC Berkeley to right. meet the first day of school, someone that had was that was in Paddock and Big Shoe. And I asked him, hey, where were you at? And he goes, I was in C2. And I told him, like, okay, well, was so and so there? So I was in C9, but like you're so it's like Pelican Bay is like you're so close, but yet so far. But you always know who's always there. Every time you go to medical or someone goes to medical, like you know, oh, I ran into someone, so he's over there. Like, okay, hey, give my salute to the camaradas and the whole thing. Because when you get back, like, hey, camaradas, salute. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. okay, well, that's another point. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're yeah. listening up there. All right. Uh, okay. So we, I met him and, and I met some professors that Victoria Robinson and, and yeah. Patricia Hilden in the Ethnic Studies program, Francisco Cacique, mm -hmm. who was at that time a graduate student and his brother was in the shoe. Mm -hmm. Wendy Pacheco, uh -huh. his dad, her dad had was just started an 18 year bid in Illinois. There was a uh, Valerie Jameson from Richmond, uh -huh. grew up in Richmond. Like I said, like any someone that comes from that community, right? Like you come right. from a place where you've seen your homies, you've seen your friends, you know what it is. Like, look, hey, we came together as, as first as a reading group. Victoria Robinson and Patricia Hilden, they organized the reading group. Those those that I just named were like probably pretty much like like first ones I started going, to. and then also kind of 
stuck around for a while when we kind of started the conversation about like, what else can we do here besides just getting together and reading literature about prisons and the carceral system? And like, can, can we create a space for formerly incarcerated people to meet where they can just be their space? We invited Jason Bell and, and Ayerto. They were both working at Project Rebound, which was the only existing Project Rebound at that time at right. San Francisco State. And had been there since 1967. And so they came to UC Berkeley and they want to create a program. Is you need an office space, it doesn't matter if it's a broom closet. You need an office space with a with an address, a PO box, and a phone. And, and then office equipment, computers or whatever. And at this point, we're like thinking about more like in the terms of supporting people as they're coming home. That's the whole thing about the, the PO box, right? So that people can write us home, like, hey, we're coming home. How, how do we get to Berkeley? In order to start that to get that space, the, the broom closet, we needed funding. And so we found out that by creating a student club that we can apply for campus funding that was controlled by student government, by oh. the UC Berkeley Associated Student Body. Guess what? <laughs> Wendy Pacheco, like Wendy Pacheco was the, was the representative for, for the Raza community, Latino community, right? Chicano community. And, and Valerie Jamison was the vice president of internal affairs. And so they're the ones that kind of found out about this grant. Right, the CACSIF grant that comes out of student funding. The one that we got was $135,000. And so the grant was to give to a student club that wanted to initiate some type of student led initiative. Mm. Well, give us the money. We're going to get this space at Styles Hall, which is an office across the street at UC Berkeley, right. get fucking some desks, get some, right, some, right. some Macs, get computers, get some sofas, printers, and create a space for formerly incarcerated students and system impacted students. And we're going to hire formerly incarcerated students and system impact students to, to start it up. And we're going to use this funding for like two, three years. And hopefully by then we try to get other funding from other places. And they ended up, that ended up happening. So first we started off at student club and, and then using the student club, we got this funding and boom, now 2021, it, it's a program with the full-time director um, that's not a student, a assistant director, full-time assistant director that's not a student. And, and, and then it has a few positions with uh, formerly incarcerated students that are leading some work, like right. recruitment, retention, and, and, and policy advocacy. What brings you to this work? People can make some guesses, but from yourself. That's a, a, a good question. Obviously, my experience plays a role in the work that I'm now doing. I'm at Cal State Long Beach studying a, a Master's of Arts in Education in the Social Cultural Analysis. I, I'm studying that with uh, the ultimate goal of, of wanting to be a community college professor. I didn't really know that I wanted to be a professor. Right. It, it took me some time. So what happened is one being formerly incarcerated, higher education in the shoe, went to uh, a community college where no programs ex existed. But I figured out how to navigate that institution. Just we, we figured out how to navigate prisons. Same way we figured out how to navigate the street. And, and, and so I figured out how to nav navigate the institution of community college because of people supporting me. But by two people that stand out always is my homeboy, Manuel Can Candelario, just finished his, his AA and was transferring to UC Irvine. And like, I was walking up to the counselor's office and he was grabbing his diploma. And I remember, I'm like, hey, what's up, homie? And he goes, oh, what's up, homie? What are you doing? He goes, I'm, I was in some college in prison, trying to do some college out here and just trying to complete this work. Right. Maybe getting a highlight like around supporting formerly incarcerated people or young people that are getting caught up in the system. But yeah, he broke it down in a conversation and told me everything that I had to do. Right before him, it was my homegirl. Uh, Caroline, the homegirl bear, came to my house because my comadre told her, hey, the homie just got out. He, he wants to go to college. She was in community college at Cerritos. And like my third day out, came to pick me up, took me to campus. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, stood behind me and like guided me as I'm applying for financial aid. I'm applying for admissions, all of it on computer, which is kind of fairly new to me. She just exposed me like one day, took me there. Bam, this is what it is. Made my notes. My homeboy was telling me, this is what you need to do. You make this campus, you can join student organizing, join a club, join this and that. And I got into a program called Puente that was for right. um, first generation students. And it gave you a, a counselor for a whole year and it gave you a mentor, right. you know, and, and my mentor is still my friend to this day. That was 2010. That was my there was support system that became like a very supportive community. Got my first highlight there. When I first came home, I went to a local community college and I didn't make it out the parking lot. I, I pulled up in my car, I got out and it's just this 
massive sea of people moving around and it was too much it was too overwhelming and so i can understand how important those couple people are and then creating the path now i think that's the part of underground scholars and project rebound just all the work around the country in terms of access to higher education for formerly incarcerated people that's why that stuff was so important because you had people close to you who understood you and they understood this system like when i figured yeah. anything homeboy uh, Manuel, right, who was just transferring to UC Irvine. When I ran into him, he gave me a little dosage of like, this is what you do. And I took that, he's like, okay, bam. Right. But my homegirl, that she gave me a little dosage, like, this is what you do. And little by little, taking those little blueprints to yeah. create my own pathway. You were an instrumental person in navigating that system myself. I had the community college figured out, but I didn't have any next step figured out. I thought I had it figured out. And I actually had a pretty bad plan, like a plan that wouldn't have worked out well for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then you came along and was like, hey, that plan, that's that's not really how it works. But you have this plan. No, I can't do that. Why not? I'm right here. He's right here. This is made for us. And I would never believe that if it wasn't somebody who had a similar set of experience to me telling me and who was already doing it. Right. right. So something that you, that you said very important early on, like you talked about like baby steps, right? Like you, you figure out, you take it step by step. And I think that's for anything, not just this higher education for people that are getting out or just got out, like take step by step, but you got to convince yourself, well, I'm going to take it slow. I'm not going to rush into things because I'm out here for the long run. I don't plan on going back. Because mm -hmm. if you're living that way, not just thinking it like, oh, I'm going to fuck, I don't think I'm going to be here long. Not if, if you're thinking it and living it, then it's going to happen. Yeah. For me, like I'm realizing coming home, okay, I know I'm not going back. I just got to figure out how I'm not going to, what's going to, but I think for me, the thing that I figured out for myself was like, as long as I'm not fucking thirsting for money, mm -hmm. I'm good. And like, as long as I can live with what I have and stop wanting to have all the things that I want, mm. right. That I don't need. And a lot of that probably had to do with also attention. And that's, that's just like childhood shit. Right? But once I learned to like accept that, like, I don't have to have everything. Mm. Like, actually, actually, and this is in prison, like, on the mainline, like I can actually live with like as a moving forward, I can live with about a hundred dollars, fifty dollars a month. I don't have to go one forty. I mean, I don't have to have two buckets when I get home. Like, oh, as long as I don't, I'm not fucking thirsty for money. I was fast money, which is like drug dealing shit. But like, I was more like even for me, that's a little slower than what some of my homeboys are used to. But then I realized like, I don't need to have money. My mom said I don't gotta fucking pay rent as long as I go to school. I already want to go to school, so right. I'm good. I don't have that pressure from my family, which it often happens for a lot of people. Especially homies that are always in and out. There's times where family like, oh, if right. you get a long, long stretch, sometimes like your family like, oh fuck, he's coming home. Hey, right. Yeah, right. you know, and like you get a little grace period. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right. But like if you're one of them homies, all that like in and out, like oh, I'm changing this time. Palabra, I'm changing. Right. Right? <laughs> get out, and you end up. But yeah, my mom was supporting me all around. My my pops was supporting me. He was still here before he passed away. He was supporting me all around. Yeah. So like I had that support to move forward. Right? And, and, and when I was in community college, I wasn't really thinking about like creating a program for formerly incarcerated people that are in higher education. I was just thinking about, like once I realized I could transfer to the UC system to UC Berkeley, UCLA. I got accepted to UC Berkeley, UCLA. You see Santa Barbara, you see Riverside, and you see San Diego. Once I realized I can get accepted, like I started realizing, okay, what are all the things that I need to do that are going to make me a much more favorable candidate when I apply to transfer to these universities? I checked all the little boxes. Were you in the Punta program? Were you in EOPS? Were you in the scholars program? Were you in student organizing? Were you in this? Were you in that? And then you write these personal statements, right? Like, you know, why do you want to go to school? What inspired you to go to school or whatever? I wasn't trying to figure out how to navigate how to succeed and like earlier we talked about like we, we learned how to navigate prison and the guy is and same thing that same way we can also learn how to navigate the system of higher education but there's a big difference like before we used to navigate the guy is and, and prison to survive right now we're navigating higher education and using higher education to to thrive but yeah and so when i got to berkeley and I, I met Steven and I met these professors and I got kind of pulled in different directions. I kind of got away from what I used to love studying, which was neoliberal policies, neoliberal economics, which neoliberalism is, is this like idea that things should not necessarily be in the hand of the state, but they kind of still are. But it really just benefits a very small group of people. And I really got into this when I was in prison. I learned learning how to be critical of the things that I'm reading. Like I was really like trying to study why are we in Iraq not just starting at 9-11 but right. going back you know and, and, and not just in Afghanistan Iraq but mm -hmm. also like you know 
in Mexico, because I used to love studying right. Mexican history and I used to love studying the Mexican Revolution. Part of it was that a lot of the land in Mexico was in the hands of, guess what, U.S. companies right. and Mexican quote unquote rebels. I was kind of studying that, but like in the modern context, I'm doing research around that in the honors college program. And then when I transferred to UC Berkeley, things kind of just change when I get introduced to the idea of creating the space for formerly incarcerated students. I was just going to say, and, and at that same time, there's other stuff going on. Redirects you. Right. So I'm at UC Berkeley, ethnic studies major, also participating in organizing something for formerly incarcerated people and system impacted people. I started having conversations with the current director of underground scholars, Azadeh mm-hmm. Zorabi, who at that time when I met her in 2013, she was a Soros Justice Fellow, and she was leading work on the outside, helping a group of incarcerated men on in Pelican Bay Shoe in what, what's known as the Short Corridor Collective. It was a group of incarcerated men in Pelican Bay Shoe who were organizing a prison hunger strike to end the practice of long-term solitary confinement in California prison. And, and so the Short Corridor Collective was able to organize people across racial and geographic lines and put out a call to end hostilities in general population prisons right. and hostilities in, in county jails, juvenile CY facilities, juvenile facilities, and even in the calles. So I got involved in that work as well, simultaneously as I was organizing underground scholars. As I'm doing this work, I'm kind of more and more getting pushed away from what I really like, which was studying neoliberal right. uh, policies and, and global U.S. hegemonic control in global politics and global affairs. The U.S. really intervenes in a lot of places. Right. We have over 150 military bases, right? right. Like really like like Roman Empire type of stuff. But anyways, I kind of get pushed more towards this work. And, and, and I figured out that even though I, I'm no longer doing the work that I love, I'm doing something that's having an impact yeah. on a group of people that I love. And, and, yeah. and, and, and so- And it's powerful and it's somewhat quick result, right? Like it's, you can challenge neoliberal and hyper-capitalism, potentially have a result. Yeah. It's probably not going to be a very quick one. Like that's- but right. you, you And I realized- and I realized that I'm not going to, I'm not going to overturn those systems in my lifetime. Right. And so, but here you have people where you just left from, and that's right now. And here you are, somebody who paroled for the suit. Were you still on parole at the time? Not when I met Azadeh. I got off January 19, 2013. That's, that's, that was my third year out. But I didn't really announce it to like more people that I was formerly incarcerated until like maybe like the end of December of 2012, which was like the end of the fall semester. But then when I came, I remember going to a student club meeting for, it was called the Human Rights of the Incarcerated. It was a group of students, it was a coalition of different organizations that were coming together to do work around highlighting issues of incarceration. And the advisor was Mike Bishop. I went to the student club. He was a director of the Public Service Center at the time, or the assistant director of the Public Service Center. At the time, he was the advisor for the student club, right? The, the coalition, the Human Rights of the Incarcerated. I remember going to this meeting. He was, it was the last meeting of the semester. I went and a friend of mine who was part of an organization in Berkeley in a bookstore called Revolutionary Bookstore, mm-hmm. who, used to stand, who used to stand me literature when I was in the Bay. And, and so that's one of the reasons why like, I got it. When I went to the first time I visited Berkeley, which is into another story, I visited Berkeley while I was a community college student. And I like, when I got there, I remember of all the organizations that sent me stuff, Revolutionary, right. a bookstore, Critical Resistance, and mm-hmm. California Prison Focus. Right. Anyway, like my, my first kind of like my first week at, at uh, Berkeley, I went to the bookstore, I met him. And so we've kind of been friends the whole semester. At the end right. of the semester, he told me, hey, want to go to this organization, to this meeting? I, you know, introduced myself, told him I'm on parole. And they're like, yo, the, my bishop, like, yo, I want to introduce you to somebody. And does it through email. Me, I meet Azade when I come back, I'm off parole. And she invited me to be part of the organizing work that she was doing with the Short Quarter Collective and organizing that she was doing with the Prison Hunger Strike Solidarity Coalition, which was a right. coalition of organizations, lawyers, community organizers, prison abolitionists, you know, myself, formerly right. incarcerated person and a student who was in the shoe, just all kinds of people that were supporting the Prison Hunger Strike and the Short Quarter Collective. And so I got involved with that work, right? And simultaneously, we're um, also building underground scholars at that time it wasn't even underground scholars we we're just building there was a concept to build just something building a group, right? not, necessarily, not necessarily we didn't have like uh, a name or anything right but we we're doing that we we're do, doing those things those two things simultaneously and, and so and i was studying ethnic studies and doing research as a ronald e mcnair scholars and a, and, a, and as a george miller scholars and these, these programs where i was doing work around school to prison pipeline and i'm uh, looking at you know how students are suspended in oakland unified school district 
and how that puts them on track to get into the juvenile justice system. And so doing all this work, when I graduated, I wasn't really ready to, to apply to, to go to grad school and pursue my PhD, which was what I wanted to do. I wanted to pursue a PhD. And, and at that time, I was thinking about pursuing a PhD in American studies, ethnic studies, and doing something around the Pelican Big Shoe, something around solitary confinement. I, I always thought about solitary confinement, Pelican Big Shoe as an act of genocide. Yeah. I can get into a bunch of, a bunch of different points as to, to why I think that, or we'll even have another conversation at another time. Yeah. But I always thought about it as an act of genocide. Again, it, it impacts highly brown in California at yeah. that time. Raza, brown, Latino, Latinx, whatever you want to call it. But keep it real, it was mostly Norteños, Sureños, right. people affiliated with those two factions right. that made up the largest population. The vast majority, yeah. Of, of the shoe. And, and then, surprisingly, a lot of white people. Yeah. It's a, yeah, that's another conversation, but no, you do make an interesting point. Uh, like, I think at one point, like, it might have been like 65 to 70% of, of North and South. Yeah. Affiliated. Yeah. That, yeah I, also, well, I guess probably say for sure validated. Right. Yeah, whether they're affiliated or not, who knows, but that's what they were tagged, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, so you were doing your, your PhD. Studying that, like thinking of like think, something around, around solitary confinement. I was really thinking about going to the East Coast. Like I really wanted to go to like to, to Yale and go to the American Studies Program over there, right? And I was, but I never made any real intention to take those steps to go over there. Hmm. But my last semester at UC Berkeley, like, okay, I'm going to be realistic. And, and I went to an event where I, I met up with Ava Day. Uh-huh. And I remember she told me like, Danny, so what's your plan? Danny, it's your last year. And I go, look, man, I thought I was going to go to grad school, but like, I'm not ready for that. I go, and I, I just got this scholarship that's giving me $5,000 for my last year at UC Berkeley to create some kind of project of my own choosing. And she goes, um, would they let you be my intern? She, they, she was doing this national research project that looked at eight states and looked at the economic impact on poor communities, looking at what it costs families and, and these uh, low-income communities, what it costs them to support somebody in prison, mm. right? How, how much did it cost you to send them a paquete? Right. How much did it cost you to send them stampillas to accept their collect calls? Everything that goes into for visita. Right. All the little costs that people don't generally think of. So let's pause here and then it'll be a two-parter. But again, I'm the homie Joshua. That's the homie Danny Murillo. Really appreciate you guys. This is the homie Hangout. Help others move with excellence. That's what being a homie is. You guys take care.